morning and welcome to Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God, His two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO, Christ for you anytime, anywhere. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. Thank you to our generous underwriters on Sharper Iron, the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. And Luther Classical College, a college for Lutherans, by Lutherans, opening in fall 2025. Learn more at lutherclassical.org. On this Wednesday, February 1st, we are studying John chapter 6, verses 34 to 40. As Jesus continues to teach the crowds in the aftermath of his miraculous feeding, he points them to the true source of life. He says, I am the bread of life. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's word today, we have with us regular guest, Pastor Jason Casper. Pastor Casper serves at Mount Calvary Lutheran Church in LaGrange, Texas. Pastor Casper, welcome back to Sharper Iron. Hi, Pastor Apple. Thanks for having me on today. It's always a treat to talk with you about the scriptures. Pastor Casper, you are also involved in the mission plant work happening in Bastrop, Texas at Epiphany Lutheran Church, along with some of our other regular guests. Uh, talk to us a little bit how that's going there in Bastrop. Yeah, Pastor, this is a lot of fun. As as you know, because you were formerly associated with this crowd of, of yahoos, um, we're involved in in planting a church uh, in, in the Bastrop area at Epiphany. And um, it's, it's a very interesting sort of thing. What's been going on is we've got a, a circuit crowd that's gathered together, four congregations, four pastors, well, probably more more congregations than that, but the, the central crowd are just four of us, which formerly was you and has now been supplemented by, uh, by the pastor out of, out of Elgin, um, whose name has suddenly slipped my mind, which makes me remind myself pastor that Roth. I'm older than I think I am. There we go. <laughs> pastor Roth. <laughs> In any case. This uh, th- this is a very interesting little deal. What's happened is there were a, a group of folks in in Bastrop, Texas, who were wondering among themselves why we don't have an LCMS church in Bastrop, and the answer, of course, was um, we don't know. And so they wanted to start a church, and we had already amongst ourselves been talking about this to begin with. And of course, as soon as someone suggested to us that maybe we ought to, we were all very interested in doing it, and so we did. So February sixth of last year. Uh, they have had their first service, and it's a it's a little church that's renting space out of a Seventh Day Adventist church in the in the Pines area on the outskirts of the city of Bastrop, and they have we have a crowd of around twenty people on Sunday, give or take, and uh, we just had a midweek service celebrating Epiphany um, on Thursday last week, and we had ten for the midweek service, which is you know, half of your crowd on a on a midweek is actually a pretty good turnout. So that's that's an interesting little group, and it is it is chugging along in perpetual motion towards becoming its own self sufficient established congregation. Um, it is in terms of of how churches are built and grow and and do what they do. It's kind of the the, the what could very well be the perfect storm of how to build a church that becomes something really significant, bigger than anyone expected it to be. What you do is you go ahead of where people might be and you put a church where they're headed tomorrow. And that's kind of what's happening in Bastrop. This church is being is is established in an area that is fixed to or set to to really explode starting as early as this summer as some of the Tesla operations and some of the SpaceX operations and Samsung things begin to really take off in the outskirts of Austin and in the Bastrop area and the population is about to to shoot off the off the charts in terms of its growth, but it hasn't happened just yet. And so this this church is being established ahead of all of those waves of activity. And God be praised for that work of sharing the gospel and proclaiming the bread of life, Jesus Christ, in Bastrop, Texas. It's a fantastic place to live and to work. And so if you are a Lutheran and you're thinking about moving to Bastrop, there's a church for you. If you're thinking about moving to Bastrop and you're not yet a Lutheran, there's a church for you. Go to Epiphany Lutheran Church in Bastrop, Texas. And again, God be praised, an opportunity for all of us to be praying for the work of the church, both in established congregations and in newly establishing congregations, that the bread of life, Jesus Christ, might be proclaimed so that, as we will hear today, those who look on him and believe would have eternal life and they will be raised up on the last day. Pastor Casper, 
you and I have the opportunity to look at part of John chapter six, a rather short section, but a lot of stuff to, for us to consider in the words of Jesus today. Give us and remind us of the context of John chapter six. What should we know as we prepare to look at our section for today? Sure. Yeah. John chapter six is, it is such a fun chapter. What we're having going on here, we started off with the feeding of the 5,000. And then there was the episode of walking on water. We're actually in the kind of in the midst of the bread of life discourse. And all of this is going to come to its peculiar conclusion. I imagine that'll happen on the next episode or the one after, depending upon how many slices you're making out of all this. This is on its way to what John chapter six in its entirety is, which is the, the great church shrinkage seminar. As we're talking about establishing congregations. This is the point where many of the disciples and followers of Jesus have a, have a lot of difficulty with what he's been saying about this, this bread of life idea, and, and this is too much for them, and they, they're going to wander off and, and go somewhere else and do something else. Um, I like to think that those folks were part of the crowds that did eventually quickly get folded back into the Christian church in the explosion in Acts, but here in the life of Christ and the ministry of Jesus on earth, this is part of the shrinking of the ministry of Christ as he goes along on his way to Calvary at some point eventually. Um, it's, it's kind of the the metaphor we use in church history is the, is the bow tie effect. What we have at the beginning of creation is the entirety of the earth is faithful to God, and then the world begins to shrink and become unfaithful until the time of the flood. And then there's an expansion again. Noah and those seven souls with him are preserved in the flood, and the, the entirety of all of creation is faithful to God. And then there continues to be this shrinking down smaller and smaller in a smaller proportion of the population. But that's actually a feature, not a bug, because as we shrink and we get to fewer and fewer and the remnant gets smaller and smaller, we eventually get down to just Jesus himself. And Jesus then pays the price for sin, death, and sin and death for us on the cross. And that then puts the other half of the bow tie in effect where the church explodes and the expansion and the spread of the gospel goes out and all of creation is folded into into this narrative of salvation through faith in Christ. Hmm. You know, we've, we've kind of been led to expect already in the sections that we've read of John 6 that there will be this rejection of Jesus. Some people are going to walk away as we see, because we know that the crowd has initially been there because they've been seeing the signs that Jesus was doing. And we heard in the most recent episode that they weren't really seeing the signs. They weren't believing in what Jesus was doing. They were only looking to have their bellies filled or something like that. They weren't really seeing. So we, we see, we've seen already that that's kind of where this is headed. At the same time, we know that these are the words of Christ that are effective for the, the giving of faith and for the giving of eternal life. And so they are words that we cling to and listen to and proclaim to the world for that purpose. Thinking through, again, this larger section of John 6 and the the bread of life, as we'll hear Jesus talk about today, remind us of some of the Old Testament context that we should keep in mind. We're not going to see as much of it explicitly here in this particular text, but it's certainly there in the background. Remind us of some of that Old Testament context we want to keep in mind as we're thinking through John 6. Yeah, there's well, there is there's a fair amount of bread. The, the the most obvious one is the one that would have preceded us immediately here, which is the 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 manna in the wilderness, the bread of life for the people who are certainly going to perish in the wilderness, aside from God sustaining them, preserving them from death by bread from heaven, a thing that they don't understand, that they can't really perceive what's going on, and that they that they have to interact with in a way that is faithful. There's, there's, not, um, there's not a way to make more of it. There's not a way to collect extra of it because it rots and stinks if we collect more than we need. And, and, and we're, only a, we're only able to collect enough of it to sustain today except for on the Friday preceding the Sabbath or where two days worth is, is, is available to us. Um, that is an aspect of the bread of life, the bread from heaven. There is also then the, the showbread in the temple and the bread offerings that are going on in the tabernacle and in the temple and it's not just the the beasts of the field that are sacrificed, but there are other aspects of the sacrificial system that are engaged in in bread and preparation of bread that's used in that way. So this this idea that bread would be part of our interaction with God is not at not at all foreign to the to the Old Testament Christians who are the ones interacting with Christ here. These folks 
already have a lengthy established process of, of using bread in their temple worship life, into their tabernacle worship life. So it's not that strange to have bread come in. Now, it is very peculiar for Jesus to come in and say that I am the bread and use this, right. this verb of, of constancy, I am to be the, the statement of Godness, that I, I am God and I am the bread. That's an aspect that's, that's going to be very jarring for them. But the idea of bread itself is not. That's perfectly normal, just like water, perfectly normal, just like wine, perfectly normal. Mm, yeah, that's right. The, the Old Testament context, this is something that the people would have been familiar with, but what is new, what they haven't yet believed, is that all of that Old Testament context was really about Jesus. And we, we've talked about this previously in looking at John 6, keeping in mind what Jesus has said in chapter 5 of the gospel, that Moses was writing about him, that the scriptures in which people look for life, those are all about him. And so part of Jesus' task here in John chapter 6 is to show how, in fact, all of what Moses has written and all of the scriptures are about him. And our last guest even reminded us that this is happening in the synagogue in Capernaum. So Jesus is digging into the scriptures and showing the people how all of the scriptures are, in fact, about him. And he's going to use this concept of bread, this reality of bread, to talk about that today. And we, again, have a short section, but there's a lot packed in here. You've already mentioned that we're going to encounter one of what are often called the I am statements of Jesus in our text for today, and there's plenty for us to consider here. So let's go ahead and look at the text. We're starting in verse 34. And again, this is picking up off of Jesus' answer that he's given. This is a back and forth between Jesus and the crowds there in the synagogue at Capernaum. We start the text at John 6, 34. They said to him, to Jesus, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. That's our text for today. That is John 6, verses 34 to 40. Pastor Casper, we have just one back and forth between the crowd and Jesus here. And we're, we're starting again with what the crowd says. They say to him, to Jesus, sir, give us this bread always. This is reminiscent, at least in my mind, of what the woman at the well in Samaria said to Jesus when he started talking about living water she started saying, well, hey, I'd, I'd like some of this water, but we saw she didn't quite have the right conception at that moment. It seems something maybe similar is going on here with the crowd. What do you see behind this question? What are they, what are they thinking when they ask Jesus for this bread always? They're, they're looking for, for uh, Pana at Fortuna. They're looking for, uh, for bread and circuses. They're, they're hoping to find the source of physical sustenance that will that will be the thing that provides for them in, in tough times that, that we don't, we don't have to, we don't have to worry so much about where we're going to get our food from, that this is going to be the one who provides for us. This is going to be our new, they're establishing. I think somewhere in here, we start talking about a bread King. That language comes up also this, this idea that Jesus is going to be the one who provides food and they're not concerned so much about what he's preaching about and what he's preaching about. It's very clear theological stuff referring to himself as the son of God, referring to himself as God himself in human flesh. And he's using physical terms to talk about a metaphysical reality that is also a physical reality in front of them. And they're not really quite getting it. Um, but this is, this is the entirety of all the gospels. So the, the, the nature of people interacting with Jesus is hearing Jesus words. Oh, I got it. And, and they don't get it. They don't quite have it. It's not well established and none of it becomes entirely clear until we get to the cross. Everything is leading that way and leading to it. And Jesus is talking in very clear language about the cross as we go all the way through. But we, we're, it's, not, it's just not fleshed out in our minds yet. 
And of course, we have we have the benefit of of twenty twenty hindsight. We get to look back and say, "Oh, these fools! They didn't catch that he was talking about bread from heaven. That was clearly his his sustenance for them in in a physical way for a metaphysical reality." But that's that's kind of how we always look at the past, isn't it? Well, so we have the benefit of of hindsight, as you said, and yet at the same time. I think there's something for us to learn here. It's it's easy for us to to look down on this crowd and say, oh, you know, how did they not understand? Because we have that hindsight. And yet there's plenty of times where I, I think we probably have similar misunderstandings of of what it is that Jesus has come to give and and making a request perhaps like this. How do, how do we see the same misunderstanding even among Christians today? Oh, sure. Yeah. Well, it, it's, it is probably most obviously and clearly established in the way that we treat prayer as if God is some somehow our magic wishing fairy. And if I pray for that, uh, I, I'm a little far out of the loop of video game technology, but that, you know, Sega Genesis, whatever product that is the <laughs> thing that, that has my fancy right now, or the, the, uh, the, the ability to make my mortgage payment on the house that I probably shouldn't have bought in the first place, or we, we look after things rather than the things that God wants to provide for us. Um, which it flies in the face of what God teaches us at the, at the tail end of Proverbs. We find that language that, that the, that the, the Proverbs say that we should, I should not want so much that I'm rich and I forget the Lord. I should not want to be in poverty so much that I, that I hate the Lord, but give me just enough, enough for today and no more. And, and that is not the way we pray for our physical sustenance and for our desires of the flesh. We want, we want all of the things. And so we view it that way. And there are even there are large swaths of Christianity that that treat Christianity and the interaction with our, with our Lord as if it were a way to claim things for ourselves uh, by way of prayer that are that are benefits that are coming our way beyond what we should ever expect as Christians and beyond the great benefit of of salvation in Christ, which is the only thing we should really be seeking after. We should only seek after the Lord and His benefits to us, and instead we go after we go after physical stuff, and we want things. And this this begins for us as as small children. You, you look at the way that children interact with prayer very quickly; they glom onto the idea that if I if I ask for a thing, then I ought to get it, which is not how we're expected to to understand prayer and our interaction with the Lord. But it's very it's a very native thing of our sinful nature to expect a tit for tat relationship in the way that God interacts with us. Yeah, to think through the way Jesus has spoken already in John six, he's talked about laboring for the food that perishes or laboring for the food that endures to eternal life. And he's told them already not to labor for that food that perishes, which we didn't talk too much about this. On the one hand, you know, we know that labor for the things of this life, the things that we need, that is commanded by God and even given by God as a gift before the fall into sin. He gave it to Adam and Eve to work and to keep the garden. So we know that laboring for the things of this life is not sinful in and of itself, but when that takes the place of receiving, looking for, expecting, wanting more than all else, the food that endures to eternal life, that's where we start to run afoul, and that's what I think, you know, at least is in part behind the attitude of the crowd here. The way that I I like to think about it for Christians today, and you used this language already in, in what you were saying, I like to think about it in terms of the Lord's Prayer. So many of our petitions that we pray, you know, on our own are what I call fourth petition prayers that we are asking for daily bread, the, the things of this life. And that's not wrong. God. Right. Our Lord Jesus Christ gave us that prayer. He told us to pray for daily bread. So it's not wrong for us to pray for those things by any means. But when we never pray for the things of the first, second, and third petitions, which do in fact come before the fourth petition, then then we're missing out. Then we're then we're ignoring that food that endures to eternal life and only focusing on the food that perishes. And that's where again thinking about this text in terms of our lives as Christians, that's where Jesus would turn our attention with a text like this. Yeah, it, it turn turn us away from the notion that that one seventh of our prayer life, as Jesus has indicated it to us, that should overarch all of our prayer life, rather than being merely a part of it. And that there is there is so much more there in terms of what God has in store to give us, 
and what we're to ask for him, and that he is preserving us in this faith and sustaining us to this everlasting life, there, there is a lot more to be had there. And yeah, that, that fourth petition stuff tends to capture most of our attention instead of any of, any of the rest of, of, our, of our instruction and how we ought to pray and how we ought to interact with the Lord. That is kind of funny. So that Jesus would, would redirect our attention, yeah, to to himself now as the bread of life. And again, this crowd seems to be thinking of simply the food that perishes. They're thinking of Jesus, as you said, the as a bread king. That's what he can do as their king. They want someone to feed them always. That's how they've been hearing what he's saying. He's going to redirect them here to the truth, to himself. And so he starts in verse 34 excuse me, in verse 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. And we've said this is one of the, quote, I am statements of Jesus. So before we we listen to Jesus say, I am the bread of life, just talk about those first two words where Jesus says, I am. What's the significance of Jesus phrasing these I am statements in that way? That is, that's the name of God. That, that's what's so cool about the way he says these I am statements. When he talks about what's going on in the in the flame in the burning bush in the wilderness before Abraham was, I am. When when God speaks from the bush, tell them that I am has sent you. This is this is a clear statement that God is that Jesus is talking about His divinity as God, and so all of these statements are, I am God, and here is an aspect of how my Godness is present and visible for you. In this way, I am God. In this way, I am God. Here are all the the, the facets of the, the the interaction you're going to have with God because I am He, and so that's the 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 fact that He is being so very very clear about this stuff when He speaks to them is is it, it can't be undersold. It it is it it is just so intense in its language and it's so layered in, in all of the Old Testament promise of what God is doing for us that I am is delivering us from sin, that I am is coming to save his people, his remnant for salvation, and coming to bring salvation by his people to the world. All of that stuff is wrapped up in this I am language. And so when we get something that is an I am statement, it's clearly a, a divine promise from God through Jesus here. Yeah, and, and one of the reasons that Christians have thought of the I am statements in the way that you're describing is the way that it is is written for us there in the text. It, it's maybe a little bit more difficult to see in English because, you know, I am, that's a, a statement that any of us can use for any number of ways of speaking. As St. John records this in the Greek, when he says I am, the Greek there in, in each of these is, is ego, a me. So it's two words, ego, a me, I am. And in Greek, you don't actually have to say ego a me. You can simply use only the verb, which is a me in this case, mm-hmm. and that counts for everything. You can't really do that in English, but it's it's legal in Greek, and it, it's true in other languages as well. When you specify that subject, ego, I, you're putting that emphasis, you're drawing attention. And so when, when Jesus says ego a me, I am the bread of life, that's why we're we're saying, and Christians have have usually taught this way throughout the ages, that Jesus is doing more than just saying something about you know I am the the bread of life, but he's actually showing, among other things, that he is in fact the one true God here in the flesh, which we know John has already proclaimed to us very clearly in chapter one. Yeah, that you you can't yeah you can't convey that cro- properly in English. It, sometimes you'll see it expressed this way in a, in a little bit more literal fashion, where it'll say I comma I am repeating the I as if to add emphasis, but that doesn't, that doesn't have the same, the same force that, that's possessed in the Greek language. The, the, the fact that, the, that we have these, these pronominal endings with the, with the verbs where you don't have to have a pronoun, it's already in there. When you say a me, it means I am. I, I am. That's, it's, it's very clear in that statement. So saying I is adding so much more force to the notion that I am is just that much more intense of a say of a statement to say that it, it it's it's great it, it it has so much depth in that language i love that that comes in there and we when we talk when we talk in depth about the text like this we get to actually play with that a little bit and bring some of that depth in in the in the discussion we can't always do that as we just read through things and hear them as we might on sunday mornings if we're if we're not actually preaching on this particular text on a day that could just go right across our ears and never really never really find us 
Mm, yeah, that's right. And and just as we read through the Gospel of John here on Sharper Iron, the place where I, I would encourage us to all keep in our minds when we think about these I am statements is, is one that you mentioned in passing there as you were talking. It's in John 8, 58, where Jesus says to, to those who are listening to him, he says, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And that is that is the sentence, I am, the same language, ego, a me. The, there's just no other way to translate that right there other than I am. And that's not, like, for us, like, I am what? Well, how, how are you going to finish that, Jesus? Well, that's what he's saying is, I am. Here is the connection to the name of God given to Moses in, from the burning bush. And especially because of the way that it's given there in John 8, that's, again, another reason why when, when Jesus says, I am the bread of life, or later, I am the good shepherd, and we'll go through these throughout John. That's why we're attaching a lot more weight there than when I say something like, you know, I am a pastor or something like that. When Jesus says it like this, especially because of the way he puts it there in John 8, 58, and knowing what John's talked about already in chapter one, that's why we're, we're attaching so much weight to these words, I am. Am and we'll keep doing that as Jesus makes these statements throughout the gospel. We're going to pick up more of this I am statement and particularly what he means by saying, I am the bread of life on the other side of the break. You're listening to Sharper Iron here on KFUO. We're talking about John 6 with Pastor Jason Casper this morning. We'll be right back. Please stick around. Did you know that Lutherans are helping new American immigrants get settled? How about struggling church workers in need of support and refreshment? And we assist at-risk children and provide disaster response to hurricane victims. Through LCMS recognized service organizations, we are doing all this and more. I'm Rahema Kavuga of Lutheran Church Extension Fund, and I don't want you to miss out on hearing what your brothers and sisters in Christ are up to. Visit interesttime.org to see how your support gives life to these works of mercy and love. What do you think of when you hear the word college? Expensive? Liberal? Woke? Imagine a college that is affordable. A college that is unapologetically conservative and Lutheran. A college that won't take a dime of federal funding. A college that teaches the best of our Western heritage. A college where students grow in the Christian faith instead of leaving it behind. This is Luther Classical College. A college by Lutherans and for Lutherans. Visit our website, lutherclassical.org. Subscribe, become a patron, and join the thousands who are making Luther Classical College a reality. Welcome back to Sharper Iron. It is Wednesday, February 1st. We're studying John chapter 6, verses 34 to 40 with Pastor Jason Casper. He serves at Mount Calvary Lutheran Church in LaGrange, Texas. Pastor Casper, prior to the break, we were talking about those first words of Jesus in verse 35, I am. And we talked about how Jesus there is reminding us that he is, in fact, the God of the Old Testament here in the flesh. I am the name given to Moses from the burning bush. That's who Jesus is. And we're going to see this throughout John's gospel. Here, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. So with that in mind, what Jesus is saying about his divinity there, what does it mean then that he is the bread of life? Talk about the predicate, the bread of life. Yeah, the the bread of life, giving giving him himself the thing that sustains it, it this is it, this is a very clear statement that that you know in in the way that he's tr- trying to convey this to us for us to understand in simple language our life exists only because it's given to us by god only because it's sustained by the lord and part of that giving and sustaining is jesus coming in the flesh to bear our sins and be our savior and that bread that delivering to us is is not it's not just a, a simple act that occurs the one time and then we're all good or, or we decide to accept it the one time and we're fine. This is, this is a constant necessity. We have to have this constantly refreshed salvation and life and sustaining from God in order for us to exist, to live, and, and to remain in salvation in the faith. The faith is constantly fed by the Lord and, and that bread idea breaks it down to the simplest and lowest possible denominator. What is a thing that you cannot exist without? You have to have bread and you have to have water. Those two things are the deals. And, and Jesus is also going to talk about him, him being the water too, as we, as we had earlier with the woman at the well. Here, it's the bread. These two things are critically necessary for life. It's almost as if you were to say, I am, I am the oxygen you breathe, which would have been lost on these folks probably. But 
the bread of life is very is is a thing that they they grasp very quickly and glom onto and giving us that and then this is going to be tied later on in the road we're going to have this tied to the body of Christ and the the sustaining of the, our forgiveness in sins in a physical tangible way all that stuff gathered together so that so that we can understand more carefully that that this is this is a full giving of the lord to us in a permanent and ongoing way that is intended to keep us to keep us alive and to sustain us and deliver us to himself in salvation Hmm. Right. When Jesus says, I am the bread of life, he is making all of those statements. And, and, and even more, it's, it's just impossible to mine the depths of, of all that Jesus is saying here, although he certainly mines the depths for us as the text continues. And he's really been leading up to this. You know, he's, he's talked to the crowds already about the bread from heaven or the bread of God, now the bread of life. You mentioned all of those Old Testament texts that include bread that we should keep in mind, and Jesus is wrapping all of that up in himself and who he is, that was all pointing to him as the one who is the sustainer, the giver of life. What do you need to live? You need Jesus. What is the bread that you should be desiring always? Jesus. He is the one who truly gives life. And so Jesus, from from this point, is going to meditate to preach upon this fact that he, as the true God, is the bread of life, the source, the giver of life. And by partaking of him in one way or another, and again, he's going to talk about this throughout this sermon, that's how this life comes to us. He starts to do that already in verse 35. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Talk about how Jesus begins to elaborate on the fact that he is the bread of life. Yeah, this bread of life, like the like the water, is is a thing that doesn't run out in its effectiveness. Mm-hmm. Right. So the bread, the bread that we as we understand it in the physical sense is a thing that we eat and then we become hungry again. The water is a thing that gives life and, and slakes our thirst, and then we become thirsty again. And yet Jesus is using that to talk about himself that when he is the water and the bread that we receive. There isn't, there, there isn't, there isn't a lack after that. It's, it's the entirety of everything we need. It comes to us constantly, and yet it is full in its fullness right now each time. All of it is, is sufficient for us in salvation, and that's, and that's all of the Jesus you need. This. This is the whole of it. So the, the idea that this is a permanent thing, that this is a, a, a life-sustaining thing, an eternity thing, and that really is, is the, the conceptual doorway we're going through here, that it is not so much a temporal thing, but it is an eternal thing. It's not, it's not just for here, it's for the forever and everything that is beyond this. And he's going to start to open this up more as we get a little further down this text here talking about what it is that we're being preserved for, what it is that this sustaining is keeping us for. It's keeping us for something very special, but but we're not quite to that just yet. We're on our way there. That's right. And you do see how Jesus is building on what he's already taught here. Again, we talked about this previously, that he's told the crowds not to labor for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life. And the way that he speaks in verse 35 about you know not hungering and never thirsting, this is going that direction about this food that endures to eternal life. I, I think it's, it's worth pointing out the way Jesus speaks there in verse 35 sounds pretty Hebraic in the way that he phrases it in terms of the what's called parallelism. And, and the reason I bring this up is because you, you might be wondering, why does Jesus bring up thirsting here in the context of, of eating? Well, it, it has to do with sort of the idea of, of parallelism in, in Hebrew poetry, that you, you have things in the first line and then you expand upon them in the second. So whoever comes to me in the first part is parallel to whoever believes in me in the second part. So what does it mean to come to Jesus? It means to believe in him. And then the hungering in the first part, again, is parallel to the thirsting. And the way that you were explaining it, Pastor Casper, I think is right on, that both of these are talking about something that we lack. How are we going to to end up with having no lack so that we neither hunger nor thirst? It's only when we come to Jesus, that is, we believe in him. And I just, I know, I know from 
previous experience that explaining that kind of parallelism can sometimes help us to understand why why Jesus or other places in the scriptures maybe seem a bit repetitive. That's what's going on is that it's that structure that's helping to illuminate and further explain what's being said there in the text. And I, I think that's what Jesus is up to. Yeah, I think you're you're definitely on the right track there. And and it it also has something to do with the way that John writes. You know, the, the gospel writers are all going to convey things a little differently. And John is going to remember particular things that involve that kind of expanding parallelism. Because this this becomes the the style and the form of everything he writes. When we get to his epistles and we get to Revelation, it's the same sort of thing where he will make a statement and then he'll expand on it again, repeating the same idea in a bigger way. And then he'll say it again, repeat it again in a bigger way. And and it, it really comes to, to its biggest fruition in Revelation where you have the, the three sections of Revelation that are all the same stuff all exploded in different language and more and more of the same, more and more of the same, but more detail and more flourishing all the way through that w- that way that he expresses that. I, I think we're, we're safe in saying this is something he picked up from the way that Jesus preaches. He talks this way in this, in this Hebraic parallelism and then it's an expansive repetition. And John does, Oh, that's, that's exactly the, how we ought to talk about this. And it, it is a, it's a good rhetorical tool even outside of, Hebrew and anywhere else. It's it's a good rhetorical tool to speak that way about anything. That's an effective way to communicate an idea, to talk about an idea, to then expand on the same idea, and to recapitulate a third time, drawing into the, the, the critical highlighted points of that idea from what you said before in order to give repetition and give the mind something to chew on and give us give us something to keep remembering. Oh yeah, I just heard that a second ago and, and repeat it again and again. More and more of the same stuff helps us maintain the things that we hear more tightly in our own memory and hold on to those concepts better. Hmm. Now, as Jesus continues then to meditate and preach upon the fact that he is the bread of life who fulfills all of our lack when we come to him in faith, he he brings up there in verse 36 something you talked about toward the beginning, Pastor Casper, that not everybody believes in Jesus. Not everybody's going to hear and listen. Talk about what he says there in verse 36. I said to you, that you have seen me and yet do not believe. Yeah, we we're we're right presented with Christ right in front of us, and yet we don't trust what we're seeing. We're not going to believe our our lying eyes. What's clearly in front of us when God says in front of us, "I am," and we say, "Oh, I wonder what He means by I am." That's peculiar. Certainly, no one would talk about that other than God. So there must be something going on, but I don't know what. Um, I think there's a combination of things happening here. Some of this is, some of this is probably you're never going to believe because some of some of these people may not ever, may not ever come to faith or understanding at any point. Some of it, however, is just you don't get it yet. Keep listening; you're going to, but right now you're not. You're not dialed in. You don't understand what's what's right in front of you. It's being presented, and you don't believe. You don't trust. You haven't you haven't come to this understanding just yet, but it's coming. It's on the way, and and some of you will it, it, after the again after the resurrection. Some of you will go, oh, that's what all this was, and then that the will be a great big epiphany for them. But they they're not quite going to be there just yet. So we're we're still sort of all it, we're we're in the oven, but it's not baked yet. The timer hasn't gone off. So keep listening to Jesus as he keeps preaching and teaching this truth that he is the bread of life, so that you will believe in him. That's the purpose of John's gospel, that these things are written, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and by believing have life in his name. So keep listening to Jesus. And he keeps speaking in verse 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Here we begin some of the most comforting words of Jesus in the gospel. And and in this section that's sometimes called the bread of life discourse, where Jesus speaks about what he's come to do and his desire and his work in concert with the father's will take us into verse 37, pastor Casper. Yeah, I love that. This is, this is decision theology, Jesus on full display, except that it's not decision (laughs) theology, Jesus, right? All that the father gives me, you are being delivered into faith into Christ, and now having been delivered into faith, which is an external thing, this extra nos, uh, Latin outside of you, outside of us stuff, this thing that's coming to us and grabbing hold of us while we are dead in our sin and trespasses 
and turning us into righteous and faithful believers, that thing that is the will of the Father is delivering us over into Christ, and in him we will find safety and security because he's not going to cast us out of this faith. We're there. We're locked in. That's, that's wonderful stuff. That takes, that, that takes the place of so much of, of what Christianity has become over the centuries where it's, an idea, it's, a, it's all uh, internally motivated stuff that I'm the one that's doing the doing and I'm the one that needs to be sustaining myself in the faith and, and all those other me-centered views of Christianity. And Jesus doesn't talk that way. Jesus talks as if the Father is the one that does it and delivers us over into him, and then he preserves us there. And, and we're just we're kind of just along for the ride. We're, we're, we're dwelling yeah. in this salvation and faith. Yeah, it's a beautiful gift. I mean, we see that very clearly here in this section of John, that, that salvation, coming to Jesus and believing in him, is a gift that the Father is the one who gives us to the Son, the Father gives these people, and Jesus will not cast them out. We hear, we see here, the Father's will, His desire, the Son's will and desire to save His sinful creation. I mean, think through. Just go back again to John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. This is John three sixteen in. I mean, just another rep- repetition and a different way of thinking through that, that the Father is giving these people to the Son. He's giving you and me to the Son so that Jesus would not cast us out, but give us life. Uh, one one question I, I think is probably worth at least a moment of clarification here, Pastor Casper, that, you know, whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. This isn't teaching, though, the so-called once saved, always saved, Right. No, we, we absolutely, yeah, he's not saying here that we can't cast ourselves out, right? What, what he's saying here is that he's not going to cast us out. We're, we're not going to have the rug pulled out from under us unceremoniously because of, some, because of some capricious will that God just decided, I guess you're not really going to be part of salvation today. The, the, thing, the only thing that can separate us from God is our desire to be apart from God, which we still may have. And some people will fall prey to that desire to leave this, this relationship of, of wonderful gathering in, in, in Jesus. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, not a, it's not a thing that, that is a persistent, irreversible state. It's a, it's a state that the Lord has placed us in where he's not going to break it. That's, and this is parallel to the, to the covenants of the Old Testament. The Lord is faithful to his covenants even when his people are not. He remains faithful to them and continues to deliver them the promise that he's going to be delivering here in the person of Jesus. So too, this promise of salvation, which is delivered to us is ours and he's not going to take it away from us. We're the only ones that can heal ourselves out. Yeah. And that, I mean, and that, that comfort of what sometimes we'll call this, the doctrine of election, that's the comfort that's ours in the doctrine of election that it's, it's not dependent upon me, but it's totally dependent upon the Father's giving and the Son's keeping, and those things are certain. And so I can take great comfort in this teaching that I am saved completely by God's grace. And it, it's, not, it's not about me. It's not dependent upon me. And there's great comfort in that. When we start going outside of that comfort, that's where we can, we can run afoul thinking about the doctrine of election or the doctrine of predestination and, and run the wrong way with it. Like, like we're talking about one saved, always saved, or double, so-called double predestination. Those are the wrong ways to run with it. But rightly taught, as the scriptures give it to us, this is a doctrine of great comfort to know that we belong to the Father. He has given us to the Son, and the Son is not going to cast us out. This should this should comfort us in every moment when we when we are uncertain. We have this certainty that comes from God. As you said, it's outside of us, and so it can be certain, and that is that certainty that God wants us to have. As we keep going through Jesus' words here in verse 38, he says, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. So once again, we have Jesus saying that his will is the same as the Father's will. The Father's the one who sent me. And then Jesus continues to talk about, well, what is that will? In verse 39, this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. Take us into those, those two verses, 38 and 39. Yeah, great stuff. I'm actually going to back us up to, to John 3 for a tiny second there when we talk about the will of God. 
that that John John three sixteen thing, we miss one of the other parts of John three, which is that that as the serpent on a pole was lifted up in the wilderness, so too the Son of Man must be lifted up. Not on a throne of glory, but but on a pole of sacrifice. So that's it Jesus is very, very clear about what it is that the Father's will is. The Father's will is that we would be delivered into salvation by way of Jesus' death. That's that's the door that delivers this salvation to us. So that's part of this will of God that that's happening in in the midst of all of this. So then in in within that framework, then for the will of God is this that everyone who looks on the sun, as we look on the pole in the wilderness, that everyone who sees Jesus and has received this faith that everyone should have eternal life. And that's that that's a that's a wonderful thing that we'll be raised up on the last day. I was actually just preaching a funeral sermon this morning on actually on this text, interestingly enough. Um, and it was tied it was tied into the to the the woman's confirmation verse a little bit there. And it's this is the kind of stuff that you actually want to hear when it's time to to do funeral stuff. When we're when we're celebrating the resurrection of all flesh, you want to hear the places where the scriptures say this is what's in store for you. That on the last day you will be raised up in faith, you will be preserved, and the Lord has will deliver His promise to you, which is not just which is not just being delivered uh, non corporally in a soul state into heaven, but but the actual fleshly resurrection on the last day that you, the entirety of you, body and soul, will all be together with God in that promised resurrection. That's that's the kind of language that Jesus is giving us here, which again, is probably lost on his audience, at least in some part. But it's it's going to come very clear for them when they start to see what else is happening in the life of Christ and in the resurrection of Christ, that he is actually not just dying a death to sin, but delivering on that promise of resurrection and eternal life in a real physical, tangible way. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, this is a very clear text from the scriptures that speaks about the resurrection of the dead. And again, such a wonderful comfort to us at all times, particularly at the time of the death of a, a loved one in Christ, that we know that this body that will be laid in the grave will be raised by Christ on the last day. And again, this is a certain promise that comes from the will of God that the Son does fully. So, I mean, what a what a wonderful text for a funeral. What a wonderful confirmation verse to give to someone. Let's let's keep going into to verse forty. I, I think you've already started to mention to us because that the idea of looking on the sun, looking particularly on the crucified one. I, I love that connection. In verse forty, Jesus says, "This is the will of my Father." that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Keep talking about this importance of the resurrection of all flesh that Jesus is, is bringing for our comfort here. Yeah, we can, we can never run out of that, can we? That's, this, is, this is the whole promise. The entirety of the Christian faith is delivered there in the resurrection of all flesh. It's delivered to us in the the fullness of the promise and that that's one of those things that that as lutherans we get to talk about very clearly when we when we preach about the resurrection of the flesh um there there are certain corners of christianity that don't have such a clear teaching in this sense and so they kind of lose track of how to handle this stuff when we're talking in particular at the death of a loved one we're talking about what's happening why it is that we're taking this this body of our deceased loved one and why we're going to, to set it carefully into a, into a nice resting place in the earth and why we're going to cover them with a blanket of dirt and, and rest and put them resting safe and secure to the resurrection of, of all flesh. They are preserved in that way physically as a confession of what we believe that the Lord is promising to do. He is promising to take this flesh restore it to life, to restore it to glory, to put, bring it into fullness of glory that it has never been, and to restore us together with him in eternal blessedness, in his kingdom without end, that that, that is the fullness of this promise. Our deliverance from sin is not just a matter of being delivered from this sinful world and this life that is caught up in sin. It's being delivered from that and also being delivered physically into the Lord's presence and into the Lord's kingdom to dwell with him forever, working, toiling away in the temple, doing the stuff that we were intended to do in the first place, now in the Lord's kingdom and in, in, in the fullness of his glory. This is great stuff. This, this is, a, this is a, the kind of promise that has some teeth in it. 
And again, this is the will of the Father. This is what he wants for you, for me, to save us in this way in his Son and to actually raise us from the grave. And again, to to keep it all in the context of what Jesus said in verse 35, he is the bread of life, that food that endures to eternal life. And when you think about the what is that dilemma that each and every person faces, it is the problem of death. What what food can keep us alive forever? And Jesus will, will go on to teach about this later in John 6, and we'll pick up more of that in the next text. But just to give a preview of that here, what, what is that food? Well, it is only Jesus, only the one who has died and been raised can give that resurrection on the last day. And this is God's will to give it to you. That's what he wants. He's not holding something behind his back, hiding something from you that that he really has it out for you and is trying to, to get you. No, he wants to raise you from the grave. That is his will for you. And that's what he's accomplished in his son, Jesus Christ. As you said, a promise that, I mean, that has teeth in it, a promise that is real, something for us to hold on to that can comfort us even when death attacks at, at the worst moments. We can hold on to Christ because we know that even more so he is holding on to us as he's promised. We have about three minutes here on the morning, Pastor Casper. Help us to wrap things up. Give us the good news that Jesus is the bread of life. Yeah, Jesus is the bread of life and he delivers it to us. This is, we can't really sort of short sell this in terms of the sacramental nature of it. This, this bread of life, this bread of heaven, it's not an accident that we hear that kind of language. And we should also hear the language of the, of the Eucharist and hear the language of communion that Jesus' body and his blood, this bread and wine stuff is part of that sustaining, delivering faith and forgiveness into us, into our flesh, that in our flesh and in our in our in the entirety of our being, body and soul, that we would be constantly receiving this thing, the sustaining. And it and it, it's it it's so refreshing to know that the Lord doesn't give us give his, himself to us in just one or two simple ways. He gives himself to us in all of the ways. He gives himself to us in a way where he washes sins off of our body like dirt being washed away. He delivers himself to us in our ears so that we can hear and know and trust that what the Lord says is true. He delivers himself to us in physical, tangible ways when, when, the, when the Lord speaks through his servants and forgives sins, when the Lord delivers his body and blood for the forgiveness of sins. And all of this is part of that sustaining, constant Fulling, fullness of breadness that's going on and delivering Jesus in, in this physical, corporeal way that is always going on throughout the entirety of the Christian life. From the day we are born until the day we die, the Lord is always filling and sustaining us with himself, keeping us in his covenant promise so that we are delivered in that covenant promise in rest in him to salvation and to resurrection, which is what he's been promising the entire time. And it's going to happen. It's going to happen for you. It's going to happen for me. It's part of the promise that's being delivered and brought forth in Jesus for us. Pastor Jason Casper is pastor at Mount Calvary Lutheran Church in LaGrange, Texas, helping us today to study John chapter 6, verses 34 to 40. Pastor Casper, thanks for being our guest today. Thank you for having me again, Pastor Apple. Let's do this again sometime. Jesus is the bread of life. He is the food that does not perish, but leads to eternal life. Life that is resurrection on the last day for you and for me and for all who trust in him. The Father has given us to the Son and he is keeping us till that day when he gives us that fullness of eternal life, the resurrection on the last day. That is hope and comfort for us in every moment. I'm your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. If you have any questions about the Gospel of John, send an email to kfuo at kfuo.org. It's always a pleasure to hear from you. Thanks for spending the morning with us. Talk to you again tomorrow.